Hello, I'm Greg Michelson and I teach computer science at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about computational thinking and the central role that informational thinking plays within it. So, we want to make models of the world in order to understand it and to change it in predictable ways. And we want to turn the models into programs, so typically we start with some understanding of the world with a model in our brain, and then we turn the model into a program on a computer, and we hope that the program captures the concrete behaviours of the world that we're interested in. And then we use the computer to animate the model in order to make predictions about the world, so this is the process called computing. So some really good questions are, how do we make models? Well, we make models by solving problems. And then how do we realise the models as programmes? Well, we write programmes in the process that we call programming. Now, we need to decide whether we're going to separate out problem-solving, model-making and programming, or whether they are somehow linked very, very tightly together. And we also need to think about the language and the notations we're going to use to solve problems, to make models and to write programmes. Should these be the same or should these be different? Now we can draw on computing science for this. It's an academic discipline. It underpins all aspects of ICT, especially model making and tool building. It's about the theory and practice of computation. It's a way of making models of reality given information structures and algorithms. And then we use this to animate the models on computers. So we can see programming as bridging models and computers. So it's been asserted that programming is somehow the new Latin and that we should teach all our students to program, but I really, really disagree with this. I think we need to teach students how to think. We need to teach students how to characterise problems and then how to choose the technology. So the key question is, how do we characterise problems? Well, computational thinking is a very modern approach to problem solving. It certainly draws on insights from computing science. It's very widely applicable. And the key aspect is that it's really not about programming, though programming is an end product of it. I think computational thinking is part of a triangle linking computing science and ICT. So I think computing science gives us concepts for computational thinking and computational thinking gives us a praxis for computing science. I think ICT gives us social needs into computing science and computing science then gives tools back to ICT ICT then gives problems to computational thinking, and computational thinking gives us ways of finding solutions using the tools. So, I think computational thinking is very rich homage to Nicholas Fiat's algorithms plus data structures equals programs. I think now we can say information plus computation is a solution. So some questions we can ask are, how do we know when a problem is solved? What information is relevant for solving a problem? How's the information got to change for the problem to be solved? And what computations should we perform on the information to reach the solution? The hardest part is characterising the problem. There are two standard approaches. The easiest, of course, is to ask somebody else. That's really a bit of a cheat. The harder way to do it is to look for a similar problem that you already know how to solve. So a good question now is, what makes problems similar? Well, they're going to be similar if they've got similar information and similar computations. In computational thinking, there are four techniques for doing this. There's decomposition, pattern recognition, pattern generalization and abstraction, and algorithm design. In decomposition, you start by identifying the information you need to solve the problem. Then you break the problem up into smaller subproblems, and then you identify the sub-information needed to solve the sub-problems. For pattern recognition, you look for patterns amongst problems. You ask, have I seen a problem like this before? How's this problem different? And we look for patterns in the information. How's the information structured? Are there useful relationships within the information? Have I seen information organised like this before? How's this information different? For pattern generalization and abstraction, we ask, what's the general case for my problem? What doesn't change in how the subproblems are organized? What does change? What's the general organization of the information? What doesn't change in the structure? What information does change? And then finally, for the algorithm design, we ask, what is the sequence of steps from the initial information to the problem being solved? How are the subproblems connected? How does the information change between the steps? 
I really like this cartoon, First Pants, Then Your Shoes, because it's saying something about sequential processing, which is that you can't put your shoes on until you've put your trousers on, unless you're wearing very, very flared trousers, but the order in which you put your shoes on doesn't matter. So in problems, sometimes there are places where you've got a defined sequence, and other times there are places where the sequence doesn't matter so much. So how do we then apply computational thinking? This stuff is all very well. What does it mean for practical teaching? Where do we begin? Our familiar approach is useful. and Can we somehow retrofit computational thinking to what we do already? Well, I've been teaching computing for going on 35 years now. Looking back, I've taken a lot of different approaches. I've tried programming language-oriented approaches, for example, using a full-strength language, using a pedagogic language or a subset of a full-strength language. I've tried functional programming and logic programming and object-oriented programming. I've tried using a pseudocode using some sort of language-independent notation. I've also looked at going from simple designs to complex designs, for example, using st stepwise refinement, structured programming, or iterative prototyping, which remains my favourite. I've also looked at component-based approaches, like modular programming, algorithm design, data structure design, type-driven approaches, using classes, using libraries, and then I've looked at pure design approaches like flowcharts and data flow, entity relationship, and most recently UML, with use case, class diagrams, structure diagrams, sequence diagrams, and state machines. And really all I can say is that fashions change. There are too many possibilities. They've all got a lot of promise, but none of them work beyond simple cases. I think the difficulty is that they've all got a very strong focus on the final programme. Of course, programming isn't hard when you know how to solve the problem, but then the language gets in the way. I think that our young students find this particularly difficult, the details of the language syntax and the semantics and the tools, and it really stops them thinking effectively about problem solving and model making. I think maybe we need to forget about what we've done in the past. The familiar approaches are useful. They're really useful at the end of the problem when we want to build a solution, particularly with more advanced classes when the basic computational concepts are understood. But I think to begin with, we should focus on a problem without worrying about how to implement the solution. I think the key is characterising the information and the computations, and we should start with information, not with computations. So I think information is base atomic elements plus structure. So I'm not talking about types, I'm not talking about classes. These are programming concepts which are used to represent and implement problem information. I think the base atomic elements are things, just things we talk about in the real world. Of course we represent them as symbols using sequences of characters and we try and use entities that are meaningful like words and numbers, but these are just things that we're talking about. And of course our things may themselves be composite, they may be made up of sub-elements of other things, they may be structured. And then we put our things together using information structures, and we're familiar with lots of these. There are sequences where we've got ideas of before and after, and things being ordered and unordered. We've got tables where we've got rows and columns of contents. We've got arrays where we get at the contents by an index. We've got records where we get at the contents by a field. We've got lists where we've got heads and tails. We've got trees with values and branches, and we've got graphs with nodes and arcs. But these are not data structures. These are programming concepts. They're information structures. And of course, structures have got equivalences. A table can be an array of records of rows and columns of contents. An array can be a list of index and value records. A list can be an array of records of heads and tail. And for some problems, the base elements in the structures are themselves structures. So where on earth do we begin? Do we have to go back to computing science? No, we absolutely don't. What we need to do is to start in the real world and we need to think about lots and lots of concrete examples. We're surrounded by information structures Think about finding a parked car, how that's different to delivering a letter to a numbered house. Think about how a supermarket queue differs from a bank queue and how an English queue differs from a Scottish queue in a bank. Think about how a shopping list differs from a receipt or a bill or an account statement. Think about how an itinerary differs from a diary or a calendar. Think about how an invitation list and an address book and a seating diagram are different. A shop catalogue, a library catalogue, a family tree showing... Inheritance, a cladistic tree showing difference, a decision tree showing options, an underground map or a road map showing distances, a lottery ticket and a betting slip 
a sports league table and mobile contacts and browser favourites and social media friends and ebook downloads and digital photo albums and digital music libraries and music playlists. These are all information structures, all of them, and that's how we treat them. When we're using particularly the latter ones on a computer, we don't think about what's under the hood. We don't think about the data structures and the algorithms. We think as if these entities are real and they are the world that we're manipulating. So I think we should use concrete problem scenarios. Typically, we think about, given a structure, how do we find specific information? How do we access the structure? How do we search the structure? We should start from scratch. We should try to characterise the scenario's elements, the things in the scenario, and the structures. That's how the things are put together. Don't yet introduce the name structures. Do this intuitively. Ask if the information is simple or composite. Is it linear or a grid? Is it branching? Is it cyclic? Is it unordered or ordered? Is it fixed or changeable? Maybe the contents can change, maybe the size can change, maybe the shape can change, but maybe all of these things are fixed. Then ask about how we access the elements. Of course, you've got to know, first of all, why you want to access the elements and which elements you want to access and how do the things you want to access affect how you access them. Think about where do you start trying to access and how do you continue access? How do you know if you've been successful? How do you know if you failed? What do you do if you fail? And if you know how to access the elements, then you can start to ask about how you add or delete or modify the elements. Then you compare apparently disparate structures and ask what changes and what stays the same. Look for similarities in the concrete detail. Look for similarities in the gross structure if you ignore the things that they're organising. Look at similarities in how you access and update and add and delete elements in the structure. And then finally, start using these comparisons to draw out the named information structures we looked at before. I think it's useful here to develop the notion of an abstract data type. An abstract data type has got operations to construct a new empty structure, or to add to the structure, or find in a structure, or change in a structure, or delete from a structure. We can see an abstract data type as defining basic operations. They're a bit like the verbs in a language. So we can use the ADT to structure how we talk about computations. The computation itself structures the operations into algorithms. So we try to make the structure of the computation follow the structure of the information, but this is not yet programming. We go back to the scenarios Let's remind ourselves that a computation solves problems by changing old information into new information. So you want to take a scenario and then think about the sequences of information change to get from the old information to the new information. Typically, you want to traverse the structure. You want to visit each element once. You want to continue until some condition is met, doing something to each element and accumulating intermediate information. So there are lots of different ways of traversing structures. We're very familiar with bounded iteration, where we start with the first element, we go to a last element, we then have to have an, an idea of a next element. We've also got unbounded iteration, where we continue looking at the elements until some condition holds. So in a bounded iteration, typically we go from first to last, and we only look at each element once. In an unbounded iteration, we might look at each element repeatedly. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we start the iteration? How do we continue the iteration and how do we end the iteration? Another approach to repetition is through recursion. Now, often people view recursion as scary. I think it's actually quite a natural way to structure a computation in terms of a base case where you're at the end of a structure so you return a final value and a recursion case where you do something with a current element and then you recurse on the rest of the structure. Or you can turn it round and think about doing something to the first part of the structure and then doing the same thing to the rest of the structure. One approach I found very useful is to use children's songs. So if you think about a song like Ten Green Bottles, so it goes, Ten Green Bottles hang on the wall, Ten Green Bottles hang on the wall. If one green bottle should accidentally fall, there'd be nine green bottles hanging on the wall. Then naturally, for n bottles, you talk about what you do for the nth bottle, then you do the same thing again for n minus one bottles. Then you can go on to 10 men went to mo, 10 men went to mo, went to mo, men, oh, 10 men, 9 men, 8 men, 7 men, 6 men, 5 men, 4 men, 3 men, 2 men, 1 men, went to mo, went to mo, meadow. Then you go on to 9 men. So again, you've got the nested recursion where you're going from n down to 0 and you're doing it inside itself. 
And then another example, which is very similar to Temen Went to Mo, is the 12 Days of Christmas, where here you're generating text. You don't ever need to tell the students that what they're doing is somehow difficult or unnatural. It just follows straight out of how you might think about the song anyway. And as with iteration, with bounded recursion, you have to think about how to start and end and continue the recursion. As we iterate, as we recurse, we also need to keep track of intermediate information. We need to keep track of the different positions in structures, and we need to keep track of the partial results. And it's at this point that you want to introduce a variable. Too much computing teaching focuses on the variable as the starting point. I think this is really misguided. We need to focus on the information structure as the starting point, traversing the information structure, and then only introduce variables as a way of accumulating intermediate information. Now we can talk about a variable as a name-value association, and we can talk about assignment as a way of changing association with a new value from a computation, but often using the old value. And also we need to use a variable to manage the stages of traversal to keep track of where we are. As we go to each element during the traversal, we typically want to do something to the element to change it. So we need to know how we identify the element. We need to know the position and structure associated with the value. So we need to somehow get into the structure. Typically we do this via the name of the structure and typically we have a position within the structure. So the position is a bit like a compound variable. Maybe it's an array in an index. Maybe it's a record in a field or an object and an element. And we have to decide what to do with the element. Maybe we want to change the element regardless of its properties, that's fine. But we often only want to change an element if it satisfies certain criteria. So here we introduce the idea of choice and condition. Maybe what we want to change will depend on the element properties. Maybe what we want to do next will depend on the element properties. Maybe we have to use choice to manage the stages of our traversal. Finally, we start characterizing the computation. Is it necessarily iterative or could it be recursive? Is it necessarily sequential or could it be concurrent? Is it necessarily linear or might it involve backtracking? Is it necessarily deterministic where there's only one way of doing it or might it be non-deterministic where there are different ways to get the same solution? Is the problem bounded where if we search enough we're guaranteed to find an answer or is it unbounded where maybe we're not always going to find the answer that we're looking for? but we do need to describe the information and computation in a consistent way. So why don't we just use a programming language? And after all, we know that programming is motivating and seeing things work early on is motivating. So for sure, use practical programming. Use it as early as possible. Use it alongside problem solving. But remember that the choice of the language that you use affects what can be described. And remember that the fine detail of the programming language gets in the way of the fundamental concepts. Very, very simple, small-scale intuitive techniques really don't scale to realistic problems. If you want to be a bit more formal in your problem solving, I think one should use a neutral notation, one should maybe use a pseudocode. So in conclusion, I think we need to focus on the problem solving, not the programming. We need to think about computational thinking, certainly as decomposition, abstraction, patterns and algorithms, but think about solutions as information plus computation. Let the information structure the computation, Start with a concrete instance and then use computational thinking to ask good questions, find well-known information structures and then guide the computation design. Computational thinking is a framework, it isn't a recipe. The components overlap and they interact. You can't just filter them out independently. You've got to think about all of them in a creative way. And I think classic computational thinking overemphasizes computation at the expense of information. So I'm going to finish by suggesting an activity. What I suggest you do is that you pick two very different scenarios from the list that I went through earlier. Here's all the lists again. And then you pick one of the information structures from the ones that I showed you. And then you explain how to represent both of the scenarios that you chose in step one using the information structure from step two. And this is a very, very good activity for a pair of people to work on together and then to come back to a group and to describe the different things that you've come up with. There are lots of resources on computational thinking. Jeanette Wing's foundational paper is available from the communications of the ACM, and there is lots of useful information available from Microsoft and also from Google. Thank you very much.